Good afternoon. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Economic Development and Regulatory Services Committee for today, which is August 13th. We've been joined by Council Members Cunningham, Gordon, Ellison, and Kano, which is a quorum of the committee. I'd like to first start by looking at the consent agendas, items five, six, seven, and eight. They include liquor license approvals, rental license dwelling conditions at 3507 Fremont Avenue North, rental license reinstatement at 2216 Illion, and a contract with Midwest Urban Strategies for our workforce development services. Are there any items anyone would like to pull, items five through eight? Seeing none, I'll move the consent agenda. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That Those items are approved. We'll then move to the first of our four public hearings, starting with item number one on building code revisions. And while Mr. Porum makes his way up, I want to take an opportunity uh, to thank my neighbor, Kristen, and her team of students from the Breck School. Raise your hands who are here today um, to learn a little bit more about what happens in government and the city and uh, just give me an opportunity to thank Council Member Cunningham for meeting with them prior to the meeting. Mr. Poor, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman, Council Members. Um, today we're before you with some revisions to the Title V, uh, referred to as the Building Code and the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances. Um, We've gone back and looked at reworking um, much of Title V. We want to rename it the Minneapolis Building Code so it's not confused with the State Building Code. Um, this is an effort that's been um, underway for several years. Uh, the principal characteristics of it are that we're trying to first get clarity in the title, Minneapolis Building Code. We're trying to simplify the language, remove away uh, repetitive language, move to only using gender neutral language, um, keeping information specific and as in a few locations as possible within Title V so people aren't searching all over for redundant rules. Uh, we had to clean up some of the organizational language so if we go back 30 years when Title V was uh, on the books or put on the books and we had a Department of Inspections, which I actually worked for, um, we have, we've got titles that are different now. We have regulatory services, we have mm -hmm. uh, uh, CPED, construction code services. So some of it is just nomenclature changes that are clear that needed to be updated. Um, we've tried to make it uh, uh, more in line with incorporating the information uh, uh, enterprise land management system ELMS and uh, again uh, removing repetitive language on permitting. Uh, so it truly is a technical fix but again it's something we took great care in doing. It lasted about uh, three and a half years. There will be some follow-up small housekeeping that will come out of this most likely um, with some small changes coming out of reg services, again, to get make sure that everything is in alignment. There'll likely be a small change relating to sign permitting um, that will come, but this is the heart of the work. And so that's all I have, unless you have uh, specific questions today. Are there any questions for Mr. Poor on item number one? There are no questions, Mr. Poor. So thank you for your report. We'll open up pub item number one for a public hearing. This is a, the building code revision amending Title V of the Code of Ordinances relating to building code. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I would like to move approval of this item. Item number one has been moved for approval. Are there any additional comments or questions on item number one? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on then to item number two. Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make a quick comment that um, I recently was at um, a convening of young elected officials and had a colleague from Berkeley come and talk to me. They had a huge controversy around changing, no longer using the language of a manhole um, and switching to gender neutral language. They had a huge controversy over it. People got really angry and I just want to name, look how easy that was here for us to do the same. So I'm really grateful to be in this city and to have our wonderful folks here. So thank you. Thank you. On to item number two. And Andrea, right? Andrea. Andrea. Thank you for being here today. 
Thank you. Madam Chair, committee members, I'm Andra Bosniak. I'm the Interagency Coordinator for Regulatory Services. I'm here before you today to discuss a housekeeping ordinance change related to rental dwelling license reinstatements. So currently, any rental license reinstatement requires a management plan asking property owners or managers about actions they're willing to take under situations related to conduct on licensed premises. As part of the updated conduct on licensed premises ordinance uh, authored by Council Member Cunningham and Council Member Ellison, the work group decided to remove the management plan based on its prescriptive format, which primarily addressed behavioral rather than property maintenance issues. As the city moves towards more education and engagement with renters, we recognize that these management plans are more effective when we bring the renter and community voice in them. Going forward, the new conduct on licensed premises interdisciplinary panel can still decide a management plan is required after a qualifying incident on premises. After a thorough review and evaluation of all relevant circumstances, the panel may recommend an intervention that includes a free format management plan for a qualifying property incident. This would be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. So this concludes my presentation. I can stand for any questions that you might have. Thank you for your report. We'll see if there's any questions. Seeing none, I will open the public hearing on item number two, which is making changes to our rental license reinstatement requirements. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Ellison. I will move approval of item number two. Item number two has been moved. Further comments and questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll then move on to item number three, which is non-sale liquor with Sunday sales entertainment license. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I am Max Cervantes, and I'm a licensed inspector uh, assigned to the first precinct. I'm presenting an application from 3Jack, owned by Fringe Club, LLC. The business address is 724 Third Street North, which is located in Ward 3. The applicant is requesting an on-sale liquor with Sunday sales and limited entertainment license. 3Jack has applied for the maximum hours of operation to be 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. daily. The business plan for 3Jack indicates that they intend to operate Sunday through Thursday, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., Friday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. They have indoor seating for 175, and outdoor seating for 55 on a private patio. On July 22nd, 134 public hearing notices were sent to residents and property owners within 450 feet of the premises. Multi-unit buildings were posted. Notices were also sent to the North Loop Business, uh, the North Loop Neighborhood Association, the Warehouse District Business Association, and Councilmember Fletcher. We have received one comment from the community that expressed concerns regarding the hours of operation and the level of entertainment that will be offered. 3Jack will be a new business on the first level of a recently constructed parking ramp. The applicant will offer limited entertainment in the form of radio, pre-recorded, and electronically produced music, TVs, and at times live musicians playing non-amplified and amplified music and singing in the interior area. 3Jack will also include, uh, will also feature six golf simulator stations on their premises. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of an on-sale liquor with Sunday sales, limited entertainment license for 3Jack. I'm available for any questions that you have on this application. Thank Are you. there any questions for Mr. Cervantes? Are you new? I am Are to you liquor. Are related to all the other people who worked in I am, inventory yes. services with the last name Cervantes? Are you really? Yeah. What's the connection? Ricardo Cervantes is my father. Oh. <laughs> oh, that is amazing. That is great you're working here. Oh, Welcome. Thank you. Oh, I'm just very moved by that. That's thank you, you so have to much. tell him I said hello. Will do. Cam, can you believe that? <laughs> oh, oh my god, I'm stunned by it. I had my suspicions. <laughs> um, and uh, say hi to your dad for me. Will do. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any qu any questions for staff? Seeing none, thank you for your report. We'll open up the public hearing on item number three, which is uh, on sale liquor license with Sunday sales for third jack. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Is there anyone here from Third Jack? Put, come on up and tell us a little bit about what you're going to do. Good afternoon. My name is Lucy Robb. I'm one of the owners of Three Jack. Um, and as Max said, we're a restaurant, bar, and golf simulator venue going into um, the Nordic Complex, so right off of Washington Avenue, kind of in between the Nordic and the Free House. Our area and all activities um, in our space face a, the courtyard in between the Nordic and the Free House. 
and we're, we're really excited about coming into the area and, and bringing something fun and new to the North Loop. That's terrific. Thank yeah. you so much for being here. We yeah. wish you very good luck. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Councilmember Ellison. Uh, I would like to move approval of this item. Item number three has been moved for approval. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to our last remaining item, which is item number four. This is the tobacco product shop spacing ordinance. Um, Ms. Silas, welcome. Sounds good, right? <coughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm here to present a, a tobacco license spacing ordinance. Um, this ordinance was introduced by Council Member Cano. For a brief background, um, the city of Minneapolis passed a menthol tobacco sales restriction, which prohibited sales of menthol tobacco in convenience stores and limited those sales to uh, exclusive tobacco product shops and liquor stores um, with a, a specific tobacco license. That ordinance was adopted in August of 2017 to take effect in August 2018. Uh, in that one year period, we saw a, a great increase in requests and creation of new tobacco product shops. Many of these were created by subdividing an existing convenience store to create a new storefront that would be an exclusive tobacco shop. Um, uh, and as a result of this, Council Member Cano introduced a moratorium on the creation of new tobacco product shops um, that uh, was uh, approximately one year ago. It's still in place today. It expires at the end of this month. So CPED staff was authorized to conduct a study to address the issues that led to the moratorium. So we saw an increase in tobacco product shops over the course of that one year time frame. So in 2017, there were 25 exclusive tobacco product shops. There are 52 today. However, the availability of menthol tobacco as a result of the menthol tobacco ordinance has greatly decreased since that was adopted. Um, in 2016, menthol tobacco was sold in 342 uh, retail establishments that included convenience stores, gas stations, and tobacco shops. Um, now, menthol tobacco is only available in 82 locations, which is exclusive tobacco shops and liquor stores that have um, a license to sell menthol tobacco. So, as a result of this, um, in 2015, the city of Minneapolis restricted flavored tobacco except for menthol, so um, fruit flavors, that sort of thing. So uh, that went into place in 2015. As a result of the increase in tobacco shops, uh, there are now more locations where flavored tobacco other than menthol can be um, purchased. In addition, there are... Uh, um, was an increase in rezoning requests and conditional use permit applications to establish these new, uh, these new stores. Um, so this is a, a map showing the tobacco shops and the liquor stores with the licenses to sell uh, menthol. And, and this graph just shows the decrease in availability of flavored in 2015, decrease in availability uh, uh, in menthol um, at, at the adoption of the ordinance in 2017, but then the overall increase in tobacco product shops. So uh, as part of the study, staff um, was able to determine that low income neighborhoods are more likely uh, than higher income neighborhoods to have a high density of tobacco retailers. The study examined the unintended impact of the menthol ordinance, evaluated policy options that would uphold the original intent of the menthol ordinance. Um, that original intent was to decrease youth access to menthol tobacco and to decrease uh, uh, youth initiation of smoking. Um, we did peer cities research for the policy options that we explored and outreach to convenience store owners. Um, as part of this presentation, I'm not going to go too much into the outreach, but Zoe from the small business team is here to speak to any questions you may have. And the appendices on the study um, do uh, explore that in more detail. So. Uh, Earlier this year, we reported back to the Zoning and Planning Committee, um, not this committee, because initially there was a, a thought that there might be a zoning, um, a zoning change that would address this issue. Uh, at that time, we reported that the recommended strategies included a minimum spacing between these licenses, a capping on the total number of tobacco licenses, some combination of spacing and capping, or eliminating flavored tobacco um, throughout the city. 
So uh, the, the spacing requirement uh, that we are bringing before you today does have benefits and challenges. The, um, <clears throat> the main benefits are that it would prevent the further concentration of tobacco product shops in any area of the city. Specifically, areas of concentrated poverty would benefit from that as well. Um, spacing can reduce retailer density in the lowest income neighborhoods, and it could reduce uh, tobacco use over time, since location and density of tobacco shops does influence tobacco use initiation by youth and cessation. Um, there are some challenges with this, with a spacing ordinance similar to the existing spacing ordinances that we have uh, in the city today. It does require additional staff analysis for any new licenses. Um, there could be some, you know, de facto monopolies created by the owners of existing tobacco shops um, that elim by eliminating nearby competition, and it can create additional complexity for small business owners. So staff is recommending the adoption of a spacing ordinance um, that would apply to exclusive tobacco shops and liquor stores that have a license to sell menthol tobacco. And uh, I'll, I'm just gonna quickly walk through a couple of maps that we created showing kind of the, um, the range of different spacing uh, requirements. So this first map shows what a 1,000 foot spacing requirement would look like. The blue green in the background shows zoning districts that allow for the creation of tobacco product shop. So anywhere that the green is showing through is a location where theoretically a new tobacco shop could be created. Um, this one shows a 2,000 foot spacing requirement. So as you can see, there's a lot more coverage here, but there still are some opportunities for tobacco shops to be created, um, especially kind of in the core areas of the city. And then a 3,000 foot spacing requirement would basically eliminate the uh, ability for many wards to create new tobacco shops. At this time, staff is recommending a 2,000 foot spacing requirement between tobacco retailers that sell menthol. Um, this is uh, an approach that uh, has the same spacing requirements that we apply to liquor stores today, um, something that the city is, uh, um, has a history of, of um, using for uses that might have adverse out, uh, in impacts. The 2,000 foot spacing requir requirement would allow for some retailers to establish new tobacco product shops as a business opportunity and uh, the requirement would prevent the concentration of tobacco product shops in any one area. Um, this, this ordinance would also um, exempt the downtown districts the same way that the liquor, uh, liquor spacing ordinance does. And so with that, I will stand for questions. Are there any questions for Ms. Silas? Seeing none, thank you very much for your report. Prior to the time that I open the public hearing, I want to see how many people are here in support of the ordinance. If you'd like to raise your hand in support, we would just, everyone's not going to get a chance to speak, so we thought it would be good for everyone who's here in support to raise your hand, so we knew that. And is there anyone here in opposition to the ordinance? You can feel free to raise your hand. You'll also get a chance to speak. There's probably not too many here. Okay, so this is the second time we've had a public hearing on this issue, so I have three people signed in and I'd like to limit the number of speakers to about five. Uh, so if you have not signed in, uh, Latricia, Laura, and VJ have already signed in. If there's two other people who feel the need to speak, that would be great, but I'll invite each of the three who have already signed in to come forward. Uh, and I'm going to open the public hearing on, on item number four, which is passage of an ordinance amending Title 13, Chapter 281 of the Code of Ordinances, uh, creating a spacing requirement for new tobacco shops. And if you could just come forward, state your name and address for the record. Uh, Mr. Smith, welcome. Well, good afternoon, uh, council members. How y'all doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I'm VJ Smith. I am the national president of Mad Dads, and some of you were here when I was just a local president. And I thank you because your support made it possible for us to be the best chapter mm -hmm. in the country and with over a million hours on the streets and saving over 87,000 families. We know how to do it, and we know how to do it well. So I'm thankful for your support, for many of you that have supported me over the years. Uh, I support this proposal because it, it um, to require 30,000 feet between tobacco shops in our city, this will mean fewer tobacco shops in the future. And as we know, the effect that tobacco has on our community, our low-income communities, and how it impacts our families and our children it has a huge impact. And um, I've been fighting this fight for a long time, trying to teach my people that, that tobacco, that addiction to it, 
there's, it's a problem. It's a problem for health-wise. It's a problem for kids driving in a car with you while you're smoking, all kinds of reasons, okay? And so I think this is a step in the right direction because we know that tobacco companies are, and our kids, especially with flavored and menthol tobacco, and a former cool smoker, you know, I know the effect that the cools had on me, and I was so glad and so happy when I could stop smoking cigarettes, personally, myself. It was a, it was a big feat for me. Having fewer tobacco outlets is a step in the right direction, but I encourage you to see this as a next step and not the last step. The tobacco industry won't rest, and neither will we, and please continue to look at ways that we can reduce tobacco use in our city, and I'm here to support you in that effort. I believe that if we can... <clears throat> You know, there's always these loopholes. I was really amazed at how quickly stores open up tobacco shops right in the same store. Like, how did they do that so quickly? I was amazed. I'm still amazed when I go into a, a convenience store. Now they have a little to a menthol shop right there. I'm like, how did that happen so quickly? Who's funding that? And how did that happen? But that's how important it is to keep us addicted. That's how important it is to keep us on that stronghold of menthol because it's, it's the only thing that they've created that really stagnates our community. So I support this. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Ms. Smith, welcome. Thank you. No relation. So good afternoon, council members. My name's Laura Smith. I live on 42nd Avenue South in Minneapolis. In addition to being a resident, I'm here speaking on behalf of Clearway, Minnesota. We're a proud member of the Menthol Coalition and also help to lead Minnesotans for a Smoke-Free Generation, which is a statewide coalition committed to reducing tobacco's harm in our state. So I, I'm here to speak in support of the additional tobacco licensing safeguards, um, starting with Council Member Cano's proposal today. Despite all our efforts, additional changes are needed to maintain the, the original intent and effect of this cutting edge menthol tobacco ordinance. So as you know, shortly after this went into effect, originally we began to see the lengths that tobacco, the tobacco industry and retailers would go to, to make sure they can continue to sell their deadly products in our community. Today, as mentioned before, we have twice as many tobacco shops in Minneapolis as we did on the day that this ordinance passed. Um, I suspect it would be much higher if the moratorium hadn't gone into place. The rapid addition of tobacco shops weakens the stated goals of this policy, which are to address tobacco-related health disparities and protect youth from nicotine addiction. We can't sit by while the industry undoes our progress. So taking action today is vital because these disparities persist in low-income communities and communities of colors. As the study pointed out, there is still a higher per capita rate of tobacco dealers in Minneapolis neighborhoods with at least 40% residents living in poverty and at least 50% residents of color. That's unacceptable, and we can do more to address it. So we know if left unchecked, the tobacco industry will continue to do everything they can to erase our gains. And in addition to the historical disparities created by menthol tobacco marketing, today our state is facing a youth nicotine epidemic. Big Tobacco continues to relentlessly target our kids, and in the last few weeks, we've learned that new players on the market are using even, well, in some of the same recycled tactics as Big Tobacco. Juul has shamelessly and aggressively gone after our kids with summer camps, school programs, and marketing efforts that use social media influencers. Just last night, we learned that several Minnesota teens were hospitalized with acute lung injury from vaping. So I urge you to support the proposal before you today, but also ask that you consider adding further protections like capping to the tobacco ordinance in the near future. The industry and retailers are not letting up and neither should we. So thanks so much for your leadership and continued partnership on reducing tobacco addiction and putting the health of our kids and our community before tobacco industry profits. And we hope you will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Cano. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I do appreciate all of the folks that have turned out to um, consistently over time to support some of these initiatives. Um, I am the person um, authoring the tobacco spacing ordinance today, but I know that there's been lots of other leaders on the council that have tackled um, tobacco, uh, commercial tobacco regulation. Um, some of them are here on this committee today, like Councilmember Jeremiah Ellison, and I know Councilmember um, Cam Gordon and Councilmember Philippe Cunningham are also uh, very um, interested and, and have provided leadership on this front. Um, I did give you all a copy of the um, ordinance amendment I would like to move. Um, so you should all have a copy and our clerk has a copy as well. Um, so with the guidance of our city attorney in um, crafting um, an ordinance that would withstand any legal challenges and still give us the provisions and protections we are seeking for our community to improve their health and not have um, uh, commercial tobacco targeting them, disproportionately targeting them as um, customers and users. I would like to uh, bring this ordinance forward. And as folks are taking a chance to sort of read through it, um, I did want to just uh, thank the staff who have been leading the charge on this front, um, have been very patient and diligent in um, looking at this issue, um, analyzing patterns, identifying issues and opportunities for us to um, continue to, to keep this line of work alive and, um, and in line with the intent of the original um, tobacco um, uh, regulations that we began a few years ago. Um, so thank you to our, um, our city staff here who are in the room, who have been um, very responsive, very attentive, the health department who's been present, our city attorney's office, CPED, all of our, our staff members who presented and helped to put together the presentation today. So without further ado, I'd like to bring this uh, amendment forward. Okay, so we have in front of us Councilmember Cano's ordinance change. Uh, are there comments or questions? Councilmember Gordon? Um, I'm certainly supportive of uh, the amendment. I know that in our discussions we talked about 3,000 versus 2,000, and of course we saw the staff recommendation and the map there, and I think it addresses the needs and concerns. At some point I have a staff direction I'd also like to move. Uh, Councilmember Gordon, would you like to move that concurrently with the uh, Cano uh, ordinance change? Sure, and folks should have that in front of you. I did want to change it slightly. Um, uh, I'll read the staff direction as I'd like to, to move it. I'm, um, I, I'll tell you what I'm trying to change is just to uh, loosen up the term tobacco product shop licenses and just uh, refer to tobacco licenses in general so we can have a better exploration. Um, I was just reading the recommendations of the report. So this is a staff direction. Directing the licensing division of the Community Planning and Economic Development Department to work with the Minneapolis Health Department to explore enacting a cap on the number of tobacco licenses in Minneapolis. Examine the implications of changing the definition of tobacco product shop to make it more similar to the definition of off-sale liquor establishments. And report back to the Economic Development and Regulatory Services Committee with recommendations on these matters in the first quarter of 2020. So I'll consider that a motion alongside Councilmember Cano's ordinance change. So we'll be taking one vote on both. Okay. Are there any comments or questions with regard to the staff direction or to Councilmember Cano's ordinance change? Seeing none on the motions in front of us, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Those items are approved. Uh, seeing no further business before us, we are adjourned.